Hi. <laughs> I'm here with, of course, a living legend. Sergeant Benton himself, John Levine. <laughs> so first question, have you been enjoying yourself so far? I always enjoy myself. Seeing the smiles on the fans' faces makes you want to get up every morning. Oh, that's fantastic. Simple as that. Excellent. Because you just did a uh, phantom signing event, right? Yes, that was yesterday with my lovely, lovely dear friend Katie Manning. Oh, that's fantastic. We've been buds for 50, 55 years now and I still adore her. Fantastic. Well, that's actually my first question is doing these kinds of events. I know you're on your own here for this one, but phantom events, stuff like that. Is it nice to see the fans and also just old friends? Oh, being with old friends, especially if you haven't seen them for a while. Mm. I mean, remember, I was in America for 21 years, so mm. I, I, I missed out on a lot. But... One thing about Doctor Who people is they must be the nicest actors in the world because none of them ever turn away the chance to talk to someone or help someone. Mm. And I, we're, 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 I think we're totally lacking in ego. I don't think we have any... The only vanity we have is that we like to look smart. <laughs> but I, I don't... Know, there's only two people who... Obviously, I'm not going to tell you who. Uh, there's only two people I wouldn't work with in Doctor Who. All the, the other 90 are utterly perfect. Well, hopefully and, and, I don't join the list. And remember <laughs> the pride you have when you're in a show like Doctor Who. I mean, suddenly I, my agent phoned up and said, you're in Doctor Who. What? And then, you know, the rest is history, of course. Well, very true. So do, how familiar were you with it when you started? Well, I knew I liked Patrick Troughton very much because I liked his style of acting. I liked his hobo attitude. And then when I got a part in one of his shows as a Yeti, that was when I realised that I was enjoying it because I got on very well with Fraser Hines and, and Patrick. And it does end up getting in your blood. You end up thinking, God, if I can do another scene like that, and then you get the whole series, and you get year after year after year. Quite honestly, it's heavy. It's a beautiful thing because the fans love the show, and it is good over evil. At the end of the day, that's what Doctor Who is. You mentioned your Yeti. How was your Yeti performance? Would you would you rank no, it pretty high? No, that was the hard, hardest job I've ever done. It oh, was really? so it was 110 degrees inside. Oh. It weighed like a, 100 pounds. And it was murder. We all, and a couple of us actually pee peed in them. Ooh. And when we got to work the next morning, we had to go around sniffing the Yetis. Did you uh, tell the costume people that they were living? Yeah, well, they had to clean them out. I mean, <laughs> well, you're, you're in it for three hours. It's like when you're in the sea, if you want to pee, you just do it. You know. <laughs> Wet well, yetis, is, we used to call them. That is the insight I didn't expect to I get know, today. I, I but didn't I'm, expect to tell you either. Well, here we are. I'm getting the inside scoop of the of the wee wee yetis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, pivoting back to cons, how many do you think you've done over the years? Because it must be in the hundreds. 400, maybe five. Because like we did the big American ones, you see, back in the day. Um, I did um, one where there were 280,000 people. Um, oh, the big one in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, anyway, it's so big that you... I. I, I the one thing I must say, having been in Doctor Who, it's allowed me to see the world. I've been to almost every country, and I was in Hollywood because I fell in love with an American lady. And um, Doctor Who just ri rises above the everywhere. Even in America, they just adore it. And you know now, don't you, with Russell T. Davies back in the helm, that man is a bloody genius. That man only has to think, and the story comes out. Um, the past few years have been, to say the least, the most agonizing watch to be polite not a fan of it nothing to do with jody jody is adorable it was the rest of it now having said that you can't have good shows that go on being good all the time you've got to have like funny enough i'm quite addicted to the big bang theory for some uh, even at my age and it's the little jewish bloke with the wife with the high-pitched voice what a talent that lad is. Yeah, and there's some of the parts of that show that are just... Uh, and uh, oh, my, my favourite film this year, have you seen it? It's called Open Range, starring Kevin Cosner. Try and see it. It's the best cowboy film I've ever seen in my life. Uh, oh, that's an called, endorsement. It's called Open Range. It's fan the most authentic movie I've ever seen. Right, next question. Fantastic. Well, no, I, I love the tangents. That's what we love to see. Because sometimes you get a guest and they're like, um, you know, oh, yes... No, oh, no, no, I, I've, no I've, the best I've guests there. always have a nice little natter. Yes. Again, on cons, how does this one rank um, among so far? Because this one has certainly a big collection of, of items, including, well, well, presumably what you're wearing. <laughs> this, yeah, well, I kept this for, I, I found this in a junk shop. It's oh, did not, you? It's not exactly the same one. Well, first of all, what James has done, I've, this is the second best display I've seen. Oh. It's the perfection of it. I love people that really work at their art. You know, if, if you're passionate about something, and you can feel it. Look, everything is perfect. In fact, I went round this morning uh, acting as a dummy, standing in all the displays, <laughs> hoping that it will make people laugh. That's a No, and, and of course, James, it's dedication again, you see. Whatever job you do, if you don't enjoy it, that's why you've got to make sure you get the right job. You know, I was going to be an undertaker originally. 
But that, that doesn't go anywhere, does it? <laughs> well, I mean, have you got any favourites that you've seen so far? Oh, no, I, I wouldn't. No, I mean, it's just a lovely... Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's good in specifics. That's not... Oh, well, that's very that's a waste of time. No, very good They're point. all brilliant. Excellent. Well, last but not least, I have to say a massive thank you for, for letting me interview oh, you for today. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's been pleasure. absolute joy. What James has been so... You know, when people put on a show like this, the work he's put in and all I do is come in here prancing like a little fairy, put my uniform on, and sign a couple of autographs. But it's, it's all down to dedication. I'm, one thing I will just tell you, just to, because you'll never hear it again, but when I was in Hollywood, I did meet a lot of people because of my fame. I mean, let's face it, Americans love actors more than anything else on earth, which is pathetic. They put us above judges and police and everything. It was ridiculous. Well, one day, um, I was, my wife, she's, we're now divorced. She worked at Warner Brothers Studio for 15 years. So every day I went down to Warner Brothers and I've been writing a screenplay and I nearly got it off five years ago. I was offered a million pounds. That's what screenplays are worth. And I ended up not being able to write it because you know like when you watch a Mission Impossible, every scene, every line of dialogue, every movement in that film is written by the writer. You try and imagine writing a, uh, you know, a Mission Impossible or whatever. Well, mine is a political thriller, and I will drop the name because although we don't think it's happened yet, but I bumped in, I met Tom Cruise just once. He was in Warner Brothers making uh, the film with Steven Spielberg, I've forgotten, uh, looking into the future, getting prisoners before they committed crime. Anyway, and then I met John Travolta, of course, um, and he loves the English and he, lo he liked me. And he has a production company, so I, I'm nearly through my screenplay, and he's looking at it. So I must confess the thought of John Travolta, because he's a beautiful man, and I saw Saturday Night Fever again the other night. What a, what a movie at the end of the day. And how can anybody be that bleeding good? I mean, it's in sick, you know? <laughs> anyway, he likes me, he's checked me out, he knows that I'm a good one, and I'm just waiting now. My product is on his desk in Hollywood, Oh my God, I can almost lose my breath at the thought of it. But let, let, let's be a bit honest here. The chances are one in 830. That's how, like for example, quick story. When they did Titanic, I was already living in Hollywood. I lived in Burbank, which was very pleasant. And they were casting for Titanic. Well, my dad and his, from, um, from Newcastle, used to work on it. Anyway, I went for the audition to play one of the English crew on Titanic. And the, um, the casting director was, um, Mal, Mal Finney, the biggest casting director in Hollywood. Anyway, the long story short, I nearly got the part. Really? But I was too tall, right? And this is, this is the reason I'm telling you the story. I was in her office, Mally Finn. She, she cast every big movie. In her office, in the Warner Brothers lot, which I went in every day, so it wasn't a surprise. I looked around. Now, I saw screenplays. You know, the average screenplay is that thick, 300 pages. I saw over 10 piles of them up against the wall over 15 feet high because they stacked against each other. So there must have been 2,000, 3,000 scripts that people like me had written and sent in. And then in the other thing, the photographs. You know, like this, this like this. There's, there's 30 here. Look how thick it is. It, in other words, right? <laughs> So what I'm getting at here, the chances of surviving in Hollywood against, and, and everyone's an actor, and everyone's handsome, and all the women are beautiful, but only the one in every thousand make it. But so like I said, if uh, I will put it on my website, if John picks it up, oh my God, I'll go mad, because it means I have to go over and co-produce it with him. Oh, can you imagine? That would be excellent. So what we're going to do today, John? Um, you know, can I you can call imagine? You John, right? And you know, the, other, the, the reason I did it is, um, the only other famous person I've lived next to is when I lived in Putney my first marriage back in the 60s, somebody bought the whole house. We were in just one, like most people that are poor, we just had one floor in a Victorian house. Really dreadful. Well, next door, somebody moved in on one Saturday night and they made such a noise, they came round to apologise. Guess who had moved in next door to me in Putney? Anthony Hopkins and his wife. Before, before he was, you know, uh, before he was star studded man. And the next day, he came down and he'd watch one of my Doctor Whos. Now, I didn't know who he was, I didn't know... He, but his, his wife's father was John Pertwee's best friend, Eric Barker. How small the world is. Anyway, two days later, Tony Hopkins, who wasn't Tony Hopkins, he was studying to be an actor, knocked on my door and said, could you help me rehearse a show I've just got from the BBC? And I thought, oh, bless his little heart. He's like, I've got two bloody lines here, and I'll help him out, because I've got four in my show. The part was Pierre in Tolstoy's War and Peace. 
one of the biggest parts in the history of entertaining. For the next four months, I was in Tony Hopkins' basement playing every part opposite his Pierre. And from then on, he tried to get me in every movie he was in. It didn't work that way, of course, but that's how much he thought he owed me for making him so good in, uh, for rehearsing. Yeah. So, yeah, so I've had a few famous people in your life, and, and he's ended up, you know, he's, um, he's a loner, and he still goes to Alcoholics Anonymous, which he admits. Um, in fact, I went to one of the alcoholics in, in L.A., and all, they're all alcohol, they're all into drugs. <laughs> Poor <laughs> hate to be an American, I have to say. Um, yeah, and um, I, I, I forgot what I was going to say, so I'll, I'll leave that. And I may have dug a hole for myself there. I think I'll, <laughs> I think I'll get off that. Well, to get back, I, yes. I hope I wish you the best with the screenplay. Thank you. And if that all fails, we'll just get you back in Doctor Who. Well, yes. And uh, oh no, but you know, just as sadly, you know, it's not going to happen. You know, you know, the day they announce, hang on, the day they announce they're going to do a unit spin-off. I heard it on the news myself, and I must confess, just for a split second, although I've known for the last forty years, they're never going to have us back. A, we're too bleed now. Richard's out of commission now. He's he's got a problem. Uh, I think Katie's going to be involved. I, I, I've not known because I don't ask questions anymore because I, I don't want to know really. But the day they announced about two weeks ago, big new unit spin-off. I'm walking down my height because I've just had hip replacement surgery, so I'm walking down this on my on my crutches. And three people, my barber ran out and said, John, they're doing it. Oh, you lucky son. Then I went down, the people I buy my second hand clothes from, oh, are you going to be back? No way, they're not going to come anywhere near us. Because now it's not United, United Nations Intelligence Task Force, it's something else now, isn't it? It's yeah, a, they changed it to something. They changed I it. So, it so, but I, I, I must confess this, and this is, I, I wouldn't usually say something like this, but I would, I would say to, to Russell, I think he misses a trick. If he didn't get me back for just what you call, uh, thank you for smiling. No, but you know, like just one episode. To, uh, in other words, like talking with the new unit people, saying, you know what it was like in our day. But obviously, it's not going to happen. But I would love to. I mean, good old God only knows. But I had, but listen, I had six years. I had a great big load of it, and I, and to this day, I thank God. I only became a little religious about five years ago when I lost my wife. Uh, my best friend died, and my son moved to New Zealand who became a Christian because he was a heroin addict in Hong Kong and he was picked up by a Christian who saved his life and uh, I hated my son for 30 years and he's now married with two children he's no longer on heroin and I can't tell you how much I love him now you know sometimes you have to go to the depths of hell to find and I, I have to say this I've been there hell is a dark terrible place and I tell you what there's so many people out here even in this group here depression alienation loneliness and slight depression, and I've got them all, up to my neck. Lost your wife, my mum's dead, two of my best friends died four weeks ago. I've just had my hip done. I've just found out that I've got a problem with my retina, and you suddenly think, fuck it, all at once. Like I went to my doctor, he said, John, you're sick. I said, I want a second opinion. He said, you're ugly as well. <laughs> uh, and that's the NHS. Yeah, no. So anyway, so yeah, very briefly, I've always been an emotional man. I think it's because of the way I was born. I was born breech, jaundiced and dead. 1941, four minutes to midnight. And I turned in my mother's birth canal when they were bombing the Spitfire factories in Southampton. 400,000 tons of bombs to take out the greatest airplane in the world. If it hadn't have been for the Spitfire, we wouldn't be here today. Never in the field of human conflict have so many owed so much to so few. Those 100 men saved this island and if we don't remember that, then it's not worth being here. And my dad was on the Russian convoy. Imagine him now in his grave, seeing what this filthy, filthy Putin is doing. They're going to know what pain is, I tell you. I know a couple of people in the business. So you've not only got contacts, but you've also got people in prison. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. oh, every good actor has a person in prison. Well, good to know. Well, anyway, so yeah, sorry to get onto that, but it's, you know, it's, it's just so bad, and I... I think we should do something. I think we all, we men, we should get up and do something about it. Start using our f fists again. We've gone soft. Well, on that note, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much oh, for this. It has I'm been sorry about that. I just, it just comes over me sometimes. It's like a red mist. <laughs> you know, I wish I'd have missed it then. But ah, no. <laughs> thank all you very right. much. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thank thank I believe you have a photo uh, opportunity oh, to yes get on with. Oh, yes, we do. Yes, we do. Oh, photographs, of course. Right. Oh, thank you.